Hi, my name is Jerry Clements, and I'm here to talk to you about symbolism in the Bible. Many of the things that God has told us in the Bible are very straight and very forward to us, and we can understand them easily. But one of the things that's hard to understand sometimes is the symbolism, and today I'd like to talk to you about that. One question I would like to ask you is, uh, when Moses went to Mount Sinai, what did God give him? And I'm sure the answer that most people would give would be, he gave him the Ten Commandments. This is the thing that we remember him by. And I'll go over them with you if you don't mind. Uh, the Lord said, Thou shalt have no other God before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. You will not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother that they, thy days will be long upon the earth. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie or bear false witness. And the tenth one is, Thou shalt not covet the things of other people. These are important instructions. This is the law. What does the law do? The law shows us our sin. And that's important. And when we see our sin... We need to deal with our sin. And there needs to be a way of doing that. So when I ask you, what did God give you on Mount Sinai and give to Moses through Moses? He gave us the Ten Commandments, which is the laws. And also, God gave us something else there that's not talked about very much. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because the symbolism comes into play, and it's hard for people to understand that. And today, through God's help, I would like to enlighten you on what that is and show you what a beautiful picture this is to us. It is the clearest representation of the Son of God in the Old Testament. And it's also the clearest representation of the plan of salvation. So God gave us more than just the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So as we look at this, I've got a picture here behind me that I'll use for illustrative purposes. And this is a picture of the tabernacle that the children of Israel had while they were out in the wilderness. And it's a beautiful picture once you see it. And I'm going to go through it now and just watch as I point to the different areas of it. The first thing that you would see when you came to the tabernacle would you'd see a wall. And what does a wall do? A wall separates us us who are unholy from a holy God. It was seven and a half feet tall. This is, this is the north side of the uh, wall, and it's 150 feet long. And this is the west end, and it's 75 feet long. And this is the south side, which is 150 feet. And this is the east end of it, and it is 75 feet. So it forms a rectangle. It is pure white and it shows the holiness of God. And we cannot come into the presence of God because we are unholy. When I looked at those Ten Commandments, what do you know about those? One of the things we know about them is that we've broken them. They're hard to keep. It's impossible for man to keep it. To say that is to agree with God because God said in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you, it means me, it means everyone. And what is the penalty? And that's told us in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. And so why is it death? Because uh, that's what sin brings about. It brings about death. And there's good examples of that in the Bible. After Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, what happened? God had to slay an animal and make a covering for their sin. And when he did, this became the pattern because it was showing something that was going to happen later on. And what was going to happen later on was Jesus Christ was going to come into the world and die for our sins. So as we look at this wall, we see a separation. Now, there was one thing different in this wall, and that was on the east uh, wall. And there, there was a uh, 
gate or a door that you could go in. And it was 30 feet wide. It was plenty wide for people to come in. It had three colors woven into that white linen. And what uh, those colors are are red because Jesus would die for our sins. It was blue because he was going to come from heaven. And it was purple because he was going to be king of kings and lord of lords. So it's important for us to understand what those are. Jesus said, I am the door. No man comes to the Father except by me. And when you come through that door, you had to have something in your hand. And that was a sacrifice. Normally that was a lamb. John, uh, in St. John, uh, John the Baptist says, uh, Behold the Lamb of God when Jesus uh, came to him. What he meant was this was the sacrifice that was decided by God before the foundation of the world. And as you brought your sacrifice in, you brought it to the high priest and you gave it to him. And then the priest would take that. The priest himself was even an example of Jesus because he is our high priest. And then he would take this uh, lamb and he would go over to the first article of furnishings and it is right here. I know this is small. So what I've done is I've got a little bit uh, larger uh, picture of it here. And this is the brass altar. It was made out of wood, uh, acacia wood that was overlaid with brass. And in it, it represents the humanity of Jesus and also the deity of Jesus. The humanity in the wood and the deity in the metal because the metal kept it from... Uh, being consumed. Jesus was going to be both God and man. Why was he having to be both God and man? He was God because he would not sin as all men do. He was going to have to become a man so he could bleed and die because God cannot bleed and die uh, while he was God. And so Jesus had to come into the world and that's a picture of him. If you look at this, it's got uh, four uh, horns, one on each uh, end. Uh, they faced northeast, south, and west. Uh, and Jesus was going to come and die for all men. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And he was lifted up. The brass altar is a place of sacrifice. It represents the cross. The cross is the altar that Jesus was slain on. And there he bled and he died for your sins and mine. As these animals died upon that altar, their blood was collected there. Then the priest would turn and he would go further in. As he went further in, what he would come to next would be the brass laver. Well, we hear the word lavatory and that's probably the closest that we come to that word. But the brass laver was made of the mirrors that the ladies had out in the wilderness to look at themselves. And if you'll notice, this laver has got a bowl at the top that has water in it and a bowl at the bottom. When they came to the brass laver, they would do two things. One, they would wash their hands. The priest would. When he washed his hands, he was preparing himself for service. But in the bottom, he would wash his feet. Now, why would, would we do that? because that represents our conduct. And so we have to clean up our conduct when we're going to uh, be serving the Lord. So we need not to sin. But as we come, what, is, what does that represent? First of all, though, it represents the Bible and the cleansing that we get when we uh, read our Bible and the Holy Spirit works on our heart. Uh, the Bible says uh, uh, that uh, we are cleansed. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I would not sin against thee. And that's what the word does. And then as we approach the uh, tabernacle, uh, you would see the little building in the back. And the little building was overlaid with uh, four layers. The first layer was badger skin. If you remember uh, in Isaiah 53, it says that uh, there was no beauty in him that you would desire him. Now, if you looked at this building there, you would not uh, see anything of beauty there. It was made out of badger skin, which is the material that the children of Israel used to make the uh, soles of their shoes. It was a very strong material. And Jesus is our strong uh, one for us. 
uh, they slapped him. They pulled his beard out. They spit upon him. They balled up their fist and hit him in the face. They crowned him with a crown of thorns and beat it down with a stick. Uh, they nailed nails into his hands and feet, and they whipped him with a whip. Uh, Jesus bore our sins. He was persecuted, and he died on the cross for you and me. That shows us how much he loved us. If you peel that la layer off, what you come to next is a ram skin. That ram skin was... Uh, died a red color, and it represents Jesus was going to come and die for us. If you remember Abraham and Isaac in the Bible, as they went up Mount Moriah, uh, Isaac asked the question, Behold, we here is the wood, and here uh, is uh, the fire, uh, but where is the sacrifice? And the answer to that was given to him by his father, and he said, God will provide the sacrifice. And you will remember before Abraham was able to kill Isaac, he seen a ram that was in caught in the underbrush and it became the real sacrifice. Isaac could not die for our sins. Only Jesus could do that because he's the lamb without spot and without blemish. Under that was a covering of uh, goat skin and it was white uh, on the Day of Atonement, one of the hol holidays that the Jews were celebrated uh, where Jesus was going to come and atone for their sins and pay for them. What you would see, would you would see a white covering, uh, and that represented uh, two goats. They'd take one, and they would kill that goat, and his blood would be shed. And the other one, the priest would lay his hands on, and then it would be turned out into the wilderness, uh, and it was the one that was bearing the sins. So both goats represented Jesus Christ. Under this was a covering of linen, and that linen had colors in it again. It was the blue, and Jesus would come from heaven. Red, he would die for our sins. Purple, he would be king of kings and lord of lords. And what they made the design in that was the cherub angels that stand before God and cry, holy, holy, holy. And they were looking down on the priest as they'd done their job. You and I don't like to think about it, but when in truth God sees everything that we ever do and God knows every sin that we commit. And because of this, God was going to have to send his son. This was not something easy for him to do, but something he was willing to do because he loved you and he loved me. And Jesus came to bear our sins and to die the death uh, for us that we wouldn't have to die. And so as you come into the... Uh, uh, tabernacle. The first thing you would see over on your right would be this. It was the table of shoe bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What happens when you eat bread? You're able to live a little bit longer. If you partake of Jesus Christ by inviting him into your heart and life, you can live forever. For Jesus is the one who brings us eternal life. Over to your left, there was a candlestick. And in this candlestick, you would see that it has three branches on each side and one in the middle. And what this represents is six is the number for man. He was created on the sixth day. The one in the middle is Jesus, represents him. And gathered together, it is seven. Seven is the number for perfection in the Bible. So you and I are made perfect by being joined to Jesus Christ. And the light that is shown by this candle keeps us from stumbling in the darkness. Jesus was the light of the world. And after he went to heaven, he says, you are the light of the world. It's our job now to carry this message of Jesus Christ to a world that is in sin and been separated from God. And only God can draw us back through his son and what he did through his word. And we need to tell people how to be saved because God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That means to say that we're sorry for our sins and ask God to be our sacrifice and make it personal. We can't just know it. We have to experience it. We have to ask Jesus to come into our heart and life. And the next piece of furnishings you would find in there was the golden altar. The golden altar uh, was a place where they burned incense, which represents our, our prayers going up to God. 
We have to pray. The first prayer that God will ever hear that you pray is, God, forgive me for I am a sinner. And we need to pray that prayer and ask God to forgive us of our sins, that we know that his son is Jesus Christ who died for us. And we ask upon his shed blood for forgiveness of sin. The next thing you would come to would be the veil. Uh, the veil was very thick and it was very strong. It stood high. And on the day that Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to the bottom. Not torn up by man, but torn down by God. That veil represents the flesh and body of Jesus Christ, which had to be torn for you and me. And it was torn by those whips and by, by the stripes that he bore for you and me. And because of this, a way was made for us to enter in to the Holy of Holies. That is the last little room in the tabernacle. Only the high priest on the Day of Atonement could go in there. No other person was allowed in there. But now you and I can boldly become, come before the throne of God because we have an advocate who is there saying, God, forgive them. I am shielding them and covering them by my blood. Therefore, they are without sin. Now, our that is our position because we have asked for forgiveness of our sin. But our walk don't match up, match up to that sometimes. And you and I need to work on that. We need to live every day of our life as close to God and doing right things and correct things in God's name and for His glory as we can. Jesus' blood was shed, made away because that His body was torn. We can go into the presence of God. And the presence of God was represented uh, by the Ark of the Covenant. Then, and an ark is a place that contains things. Uh, it contained Noah and his family. And that was the only way to uh, be protected in uh, olden times when the flood came. There was another ark that we know of, and that was Noah. I mean Moses' ark, where he was shielded from death. And now, once again, God has used an ark. Ark is a container. It's the bottom part of what we're looking at here. Uh, and it contained three things. It was made out of acacia wood overlaid with gold and it had three things in it. One was the manna, which was in the uh, wilderness that kept the people alive. And God is what keeps you and I alive. And also in there was Aaron's rod that budded, showing that Jesus and God can bring things back from the dead. This rod bloomed, and it says that it put little almond flowers on it, and the fruit was then uh, upon it. So God can bring things back to life. One day I uh, await the time when I die, I will be brought back to life by God, and I will be taken to heaven to be with Him forever. And I know that because I have this assurance in God's Word and He does not lie. God loves me and God loves you just as much as He does me. And there is salvation under no other name under heaven other than His. Can you know, name another God who came back to life? Uh, and the answer is no. He is the only one who has the power over uh, death. And that's the God I, I serve. And I'm sure many of you serve. But if you do not accept him as Lord and Savior, then he is not your God yet. You may be thinking about it, but you need to make a decision on it. The other thing that was on that uh, Ark of the Covenant was these two angels. And they were looking down on a solid piece of gold, which made the lid. Uh, this was all in one piece. It was made out of purest gold. When you get more, uh, when you get closer to God, everything grows more precious. And those angels were looking down in the middle of the mercy seat. The high priest would take the blood from the brazen altar. He would come in and on the day of atonement, he would come behind the veil and there he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice out in the middle. And so when those angels were looking down, what did they see? They saw the blood of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, they saw the blood of the sacrifice at that time, I should say. But what God sees is the blood of Jesus Christ. 
because that is the true and the final sacrifice that was to be made. If the mercy seat was gone, what would those angels be looking at? They would be looking at those Ten Commandments down there. Those Ten Commandments, the laws that we could not uh, keep, we would only be condemned. But God didn't just condemn us. He made a way for you and I to be saved. And that is through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can see what a beautiful example this is. If you look one more time over to this picture, you would see these tents of all these uh, these tribes of Israel. There was 12 of them. They had their place that they were supposed to take. All the tents faced toward this tabernacle because that shining light that you see back here is a representation of God for there God came to dwell with man. The word tabernacle means dwelling place. How could, any, how could God get any closer to that, uh, to us? Well, He did. Because again, He came and He tabernacled in the body of Jesus Christ. And now He comes after Jesus died. And where does God dwell? Once we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes within our soul and He is, sticks closer to us than a brother. What a beautiful, beautiful picture we have. What a wonderful God we serve. And He wants you and I to come to Him. He wants us to understand what He has done for us. And then He wants us to act. We don't need to be hearers, but we need also to be uh, people who are doers. And why do I do what I do? I do what I do because my heart is thankful to God and I appreciate what He has done for me. And what He has done for me, He would like to do for you. Like I said a while ago, He don't love me any more than He does you. You're very precious in His sight and He sent His Son to die for you. If you would, at this time, I would like to pray a prayer and I would like to ask you to think about becoming a Christian. And if God has spoken to your heart through this, then you need to move and do something about it. And you, if you want to be saved, you would pray a prayer. There's no magic words in what I say, but it's an attitude of your heart that you must have. And I will pray a prayer, and if you would pray along with me and ask Jesus to come into your heart and life, God will save your soul. Dear Heavenly Father, I've told the symbolism of the tabernacle. I've showed the laws that we've all broken, and we've all come short of your glory, and we don't deserve to go to heaven. But God, you made a way, and that was through Jesus Christ. And through Him, we are able to come and be with you. I believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. I believe He came and lived life without sin. I believe He died on a cross in payment for my sins. And if you right now, if you're lost, ask God to come into your heart and soul and take your sins away. And He says, I will come in. And he says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. If you've done this, if you would contact David Guthrie through this ministry and tell him that you've done it, it will be your way of acknowledging to the world what you have done. We encourage you then to go and join a church and join believers uh, and be on the job working for God, telling him this great plan of salvation. God bless you. Thank you for listening.